longer anything? Okay. Um, we're going to go with the student report and then the presentation. Okay. Julie, I'm sorry, it's Julie, yeah. Julia uh, Thorstadt, um, class of 2021. Welcome. Thank you. I'm Julia, and for academic matters, sophomores and juniors who took the practice SATs can see their scores on December 11th. This past Saturday, some students started their first round of SAT testing. Many seniors are finishing submitting college applications, and some have heard back from their early decision or early action choices. For the arts, Masters debuted Shrek the Musical, and their opening weekend was a massive success. This week's performance is sold out as well. Winter sports have begun practicing and will soon have their season opening games. Winter track especially has a meet on Saturday. Many clubs are running events. Interact will be Christmas caroling to senior citizens at Peabody Court on December 19th. Eco Team is encouraging students to pledge to reduce their use of plastic and recycle whenever possible. Students involved will sign their name on a bottle cap that will be used to make a large art project. Students can donate unwrapped toys for a Take a Tag event where they donate the gifts in exchange for a tag on the bulletin board. Additionally, the Parents Association will welcome alumni Travis Roy to speak to students on December 5. And for my student work, I brought this an assignment for my 18th graduate in science class. And this is the reason for it. Ms. Kerrigan's goal is to simulate speed dating where each student created a profile about a certain biome in the world to talk about to the other person. Yeah, mine is a coral reef, and so things we talked about were pH, salinity, species that inhabit that biome, and how humans can impact the region. And it was a unique project because, you know, we got to use pickup lines about our biome, and <laughs> it was a fun way to talk to the students. I was just going to say, I, I, I went to Shrek, it was fantastic, my kids loved it, and I don't know if you guys, I mean, it's pretty much sold out now, but if you can go, you should definitely go, it's, my kids are just singing all the songs now, and the boys are walking around like, or bar quads, and it's just the whole time, so. Anyone else? Well, thank you. Yeah, they did a very good job for your first time. All right. Um, Mr. McKay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome to the annual School Committee Night at the Hood School. Thank you for joining us again this year. I love this little tradition. I was happier to move up towards away from the uh, state mandated testing and get you closer to December break, so that's great. It's a wonderful time to have you here. Um, again, like we usually do, I'm excited to share some of the amazing things that we're doing here at the Hood School, so, some nice new initiatives. We're going to talk about um, some work that's going on in grade three. The state of Massachusetts and that curriculum. We're going to talk about our student council and what they're up to. Mrs. Clary's going to speak regarding STEAM Night, which was a huge success here at the Hood School. Um, I'm sure you've heard that we did not win the turkey trot again. It was very disappointing for me, but we did have some amazing runners and they did really well and they're going to come and share their experience and their experience that they had as part of our running club. Uh, and then we're going to talk about stand-up desks a new initiative that we have here, and then we're going to close it out with the Hood School Chorus singing uh, a winter compilation. So I hope you look forward to a great night. We're going to start off with our third grade group here, uh, Mr. Larson's class. And Thank you, Mr. Kidd. This is Mr. Larson. Boys and girls, please stand. And I'm going to bring you guys up a little bit. We need to do a little post operative work here. Would you come around this way and bring us into the semicircle over here? You can down a little bit. There you go, perfect, right there, good. Pull down, look at the screen. Michael, you're good, right there. And you guys are gonna come over this way. Kelsey, would you come over here? Good job. Right over here, right follow Kelsey. Shoulder to shoulder. A little bit more, Kelsey. I'm gonna find you, find you. Are you guys ready? Are you guys ready? Yes. Well, say it like you mean it. Yes, like I mean it. Ladies and gentlemen, please uh, remain standing after the Pledge of Allegiance for a brief tribute to our president for the rest of the Capitol Hill this evening. Please rise for the pledge.
get started throughout the record. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, honored guests. My name is Michael Starr, and I'm a third grade student here at the Hood School. Please join our class by honoring America by reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. Which we did already. <laughs>
past, like we hanging out, walking by the classroom every once in a while, and, and hearing that song, and just watching you enjoy it. So I'm happy you learned a lot about the state of Massachusetts. I love that book, and thank you for coming on tonight. Much appreciated, job. Well done. Thank you.
Okay. Yes. We have the second round of read again since we didn't have a chance to hear it because of my yeah. game. Hi, I am Rita. Throughout the year, we organize different fundraisers. Tonight, we will tell you about two of our most popular events. Every September, we collect food for the North Reading Food Pantry. This year, we, will collect, we collected over 20 boxes. Every day for a week, we would help collect and organize the food at the food school generously donated. At the end of the fundraiser, the North Reading Food Pantry came to pick it all up. It's nice knowing that all our friends and neighbors in North Reading have a place to go and get food if they need to. So we're quite proud of this group. It's definitely that next level of dedication, a lot of extra work on them on their part, and a lot of extra work for the leaders, but it's all good, good stuff, and we appreciate it. It's a nice beginning leadership role. Um, so we see a lot of great things. Do you have any questions for any members of the school council? Did you have a role on how much you wanted to collect out of the beer pantry? Can you reach that? No, we did not. <laughs> so our, our latest fundraiser is the Toys for Tots started today. We it goes until next Monday. Today was we were supposed to wear festive sweaters. Yes, I forgot. <laughs> so I have to do a little better job of following up with that. But everybody was dressed in their best sweaters today and dropping off toys for tots. So they do great, awesome, great things for us and make us really look good. So we appreciate everything you do. Thank you. So everyone on the committee knows and everyone in the audience knows that we spend a lot of time talking about our maker space. Um, our science curriculum and those hands-on activities that we have for our, our learners. So last year we engaged in a, a hands-on activity and we felt that very valuable. We saw a lot in that for the parents and a lot in that for the committee. So this year we, we I'm not going to take any credit, this is Clary emailed me over the summer and wanted to do a STEAM night for parents. So I'm going to let her speak a little bit about that and just you know, a little bit about Mrs. Clary. She's just had She's always been an amazing professional in my building, but the past two or three years have been a shining star. Um, yeah, so we're quite proud of her. Uh, um, we're the Patriots um, STEM Teacher of the Year, so that was quite an accomplishment. And, and, you know, we talk a lot about our science schools here at the Hood School and the amount of students that we had advanced and proficient, and she certainly Describe as a baseball analogy with that, that she was just at the end of the line and she, she hit the home run with that group of kids and it was a perfect timing of teaching and learning and it was just a wonderful thing to see and I think it was her hard work that paid off at the end so much appreciated. November 8th, which at the time, I had no idea that there was even a STEAM week. So when I found out I was a week later, I was like, oh, poor timing on my part. But it was already planned and in the schedule, so it was okay. Um, we sent out an email early in October to ask for volunteers, and fortunately, 14 teachers stepped up and helped out planning and organizing the event, helping gather supplies and putting everything together. And then in mid-October, I went to the PA, and they sent out a save the date for all the parents. And late October, we did a presentation with the PA, and they offered us $250 to help us buy all the little supplies that we needed to get all these activities done. So we used activities that we found online, and we were able to set up 14 different stations, including hands-on activities, new ideas involving technology that the students were using in digital learning, and a lot of fun, different hands-on experiences. So some of the examples were globs in a bottle, which worked with the ideas of different densities of fluids and chemical reactions to cause that kind of lava lamp effect. Uh, another one was the moon-based landing. It involved teamwork and collaboration with a group of people, up to eight people, and they had to figure out force and balance to land a device without uh, the ball falling off the top. You can actually see that in the top left-hand corner. 
or from your, sorry, your top right. Um, and then we did another one with stop motion video, working with the iPads to create short stop motion videos using the new apps. Um, in the end, we had about 80 students in attendance from 40 different families. And at the door, the parents were given a passport, and I have examples of the passport here, that the parents, as they went to each station, they get a stamp in their passport saying they completed it, and then they use those stamps to get popcorn at the end that was donated by the PA. And all of the families worked together to complete the task, so it wasn't just the students working independently, the parents and the students worked together as a team to solve all these STEAM problems that they came across. So we actually have, Okay, two of the stop motion videos that were created. So they're short stop motion videos, but they're cute little videos about how the students kind of use this time. <laughs> so that one you can see the player shooting the basketball. And then this one, the student ends up spelling out her name with beads over the course of the video. Those are pretty much it. But it gives a good opportunity for the students to kind of dabble in different technologies and see the way that the learning they do in school kind of can be something that they can take and um, use later on. Yes. All right, so you have some packets with all the different activities that were offered along with some of the things that were offered at each station. And then I'll just give you the passports that were given out as well.
this is Drew, Pierce, and Trella. Can you be B.R. Two Nichols, Trevor Beck, Dana, and Pierce Brown? We are here this evening to talk about two amazing activities in the Hood School, Focus Fitness and Hand Dog Hunters. The Focus Fitness group met weekly during the fall. The goal of this group is to provide a great wake up. To a group of students in grades kindergarten through grade two, this group, this group of students arrived weekly and participated in some amazing lessons and activities. The Star Jumps and Play for Everyone's Famous. The students were also educated on healthy eating habits and healthy lifestyle choices. The Hound Dog Hustlers also met weekly during the fall. You may have seen us running around the streets behind our school. The goal of the Hound Dog Hustlers program is to provide an opportunity for a student to learn about and participate in a running club while developing a passion for this activity. The volunteers for this group will be recognized later in the school year, but we want to send out a thank you to the following Focus Fitness volunteers. Anne Ng, Julia Hinch, Caitlin Stevens, Jessica Vanchet, and Christian Dane. Hound Dog Hustler volunteers, Jason Catalano, Danielle Catalano, Erica Zimmerman, Jessica Blanchett, and Bob Cockle. One parent testimonial exemplifies our goal. Running Club is a great program that our son has thoroughly enjoyed. He has discovered that he loves to run, that he's even encouraged his dad to get out and run with him a few times. His brother and sister are also joining. Thanks so much for the inspiration and encouragement. As the Hood School motto goes on, hand in hand, in hand in hand together we can. These activities would not be possible without a strong group of parents working collaboratively with our school.
it's not just us as a school, it was that opportunity working with the parents to make sure that everybody was accounted for along the way. Did just fall in spring or something? So we've, we've always done it in the fall. Um, it gets a little bit harder and crazier in the spring with everyone's busy schedule. So we try, we, we, we got a couple runs in last spring, um, but primarily it's, it's a lead up to the turkey trot is what we pitch it as. <laughs> next, so, next, next year you'll get slugged with Schultz. That's right. That's, that's right. right. <laughs> I really wish these people who are racing me would tell me that they're racing me. <laughs> I know, we kept it a seat. That really wasn't fair. No, I have no, no clue. Not fair enough. He drops that bomb and he beat me by eight seconds. <laughs> so I'll also say that when you're participating in the turkey trot, you based on the assumption that it's a race. So it's a community you know. gathering. <laughs> no tourists. <laughs> and, 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 and Mr. Quinlan never likes to hear this, but the last time I raced Mr. Quinlan in the turkey trot, I did. Another oh. example of someone who didn't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> he has not run since that day. Eight years ago. <laughs> Mr. Quinlan is embracing the true spirit of the event. Yeah. That's right. Right? <laughs> Except they left me in the dust. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good fun and that's part of it. So it was, a, it was a good time and a good time to have my all. So any other questions on there? So, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, boys. Well done. So I'm gonna introduce Mrs. LaCava. Mrs. LaCava is our occupational therapist. Um, as many of you have been walking around the middle school, you see at the main office of the middle school, their, their, their the staff members are standing up at stand-up desks. I have many children throughout the building on different types of seating arrangements, um, some bouncy balls, some yoga balls, some seats with some um, rubberized straps on them for anxiety or just for movement breaks and those kind of things. So I became very interested in this this initiative that Mrs. McConnell brought to you, so I'm going to let her talk a little bit about stand-up desks. Welcome. Um, so I wanted to bring the stand-up desks here based on an initiative that I did at my last position. Um, I was there for 13, 14 years, and um, you know, I'd heard about the desks, I had seen some research on the desks, um, one man in particular, Mark Benden, he's out of the um, Texas A&M, and he's done some research on the standing desks, and it's a little, you know, there's been plenty of articles, and, and there has been some inconsistent results I've seen with the articles, but he has found some success with um, fewer disruptive behaviors, more um, active engagement, and also with increase in energy expenditure, when kids are allowed to stand up and move around. Not to say that we want to be standing at the standing desk all day long. You don't really want to be sitting all day. You don't really want to be standing all day. It's kind of that option to move around and be in different positions. Um, again, the data, there needs to be more um, studies done you know, to support it. Um, but basically, the biggest data that I found was just the success when I brought them into my old position. The teachers and students loved them. You know, Everybody. It was just such positive feedback, so I wanted to bring them here. Um, so I wrote a grant for the um, PA, and they have been so, so generous in supporting this. And I piloted 10 desks at the end of last year. I kind of just fielded teachers on who wanted to try one in their desk, and I got 10 teachers back who wanted to. Um, so they've been in their classrooms now. And so here, so I kind of did a check-in um, earlier this year, and here's what the teachers are saying. Um, Stephanie Chicrella said, my students love the standing desk. Um, can everyone see it? Okay, I don't need to read it. Um, and then Kelly Costa in third grade, we have one and we love it. And we have a few more. Um, Anne Marie Wright and Michelle Heffernan. I have more, I just picked kind of four of them to represent different grades. They're in grades one through grades five. Not every um, classroom has one yet. Um, and Marie Wright uses them all the time. She uses them every day. She had it on her, you know, when the kids rotate their jobs and what to do, there's a standing desk list too, because the kids, they just all want to try them. So they get every week, so it is, you know, gets the standing desk. Um, and same thing with fifth grade. They just love them. 
So I thought I'd get some sound bites from some of the kids from their perspective. She said, um, when she's sitting, it makes the days longer, and when she's standing, it makes the days shorter. And I just thought that was kind of a cute perspective that when she was standing, you know, I interpreted it a little, that when she's standing, she's just a little more actively engaged, and it just feels like the day's longer than when she's sitting, and it's just a little more dragging out. Um, so I thought that was a good perspective. These are just some um, random pictures, totally not posed. I kind of walked around with my camera um, and peeked in on classrooms and just snapped some pictures of all the classrooms using them. So they've been received with some great feedback. The kids love them, the staff love them, the PA has been so supportive, and they're continuing to be supportive. We're gonna get some more, so all the classes can have them, and some teachers want to. Um, some teachers find them helpful more for you know, one or two kids who have a harder time with attention and movement, um, but all the kids really want them, so having two will allow just more kids to be able to have access to them. So thank you, PA. Any questions? Any questions? So the research you're talking about, does that, does that apply specifically to um, academia or was that just so Mark, guests in general? Mark Benden is more academia and a lot of the research is done with elementary. His is more with college um, level, but there has been some research with elementary. Um, the college level has been a little bit more conclusive than he's been finding. The elementary level hasn't been as conclusive. Um, it's been, you know, some one study will find it and another study will, will find it helpful and another study will just kind of find it not harmful, but not yielding like significant results that it's that helpful. Um, I think it can be a hard thing to measure, and um, again, this, the studies aren't super rigorous that they're doing for them, so there needs to be more, a little more rigorous as far as research studies go. Um, they're a little loose in how they're defining things and how they're measuring things. Um, but like I said, just hearing it anecdotally. Um, I think it's a fairly powerful research. It's fairly new in the academic world. It is. And I think the ideal would be when we have a zillion dollars spent is to have desks that could be either sitting yes. or standing. Yes. So then sure. the student can make their own decision yeah. at that time, yeah. right? Yeah, but and a lot of the research that's been doing in the workplace, you know, it's a lot of, um, you know, make sure you're in good ergonomics. And again, you don't want to stand up all day. It's just right. giving that option to stand up and sit down and be mobile and move your body around and change positions. And, they found research in the workplace too. Is the height easily adjusted? It is adjustable. Um, you just It's pretty easy. You need an Allen wrench. So there's like four screws on the bottom and you just Allen wrench them and lift them up. So it's not really something a student could do um, on the ones that we have. Um, I'm sure there's easier ones that are way more expensive that you know maybe have like a lever that you can go up and down. And that's not what you know I got here. That was kind of out of out of the budget. Um, so that is, you know, something that's a little difficult to admit because you do want, you know, your elbows at at least a 90 degree when you're standing, so there's a lot of air on height um, in the building, so that is one thing. That maybe two would help with one shorter one, one taller one. Any do you, questions? Do you think, this might not be a question for you guys necessarily, but not that became a thought on it, but do you think 
think this is something that especially the swinging bar. I'm just wondering about like kids with you know students that have attention issues. This could even start being incorporated in IEPs or something like that. Where like, if if you see an improvement in this, do you think that's something that it could happen in the future? So what you see a lot of is language around flexible seating, yeah. right? So for example, the yoga ball to sit in and those kind of things where they have the opportunities for movement. So in an IEP or something like that, you would see something around like the language of movement breaks. Mm -hmm. and, and so when a child takes a movement break, sometimes they take that movement break and they take a walk or something like that. To have access to that moving bar, it gives them that kinesthetic movement and you know, hopefully right. achieves that goal and keeps them in that same physical space because they're getting their needs met. Um, I love them, they self-select it too, so you can see those kids like, so much of it, what we do is, is an IEP or a 504 or something like that. This is definitely designed to meet diverse needs in that sense, but it's also designed to be like a universal accommodation for all kids that can just access it, whether they, you know, identify it or not. I mean, I just remember myself as a student, I, could, I was always tapping my feet or, or something like that, so. Yeah. And, and even adults, like you look around and see who's fidgeting with their pen, and you know, it's always, we're, we, all, we all do stuff. My former freshman English teacher was shaking his head yes because he remembers me. <laughs> 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 my freshman English oh, teacher. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so excellent. Uh, uh, More questions on this topic? Thank you. Again? That was great. Thank, Thank you. you. So much appreciate to all the work that they do. Uh, we wouldn't be doing anything that we're doing if we didn't have their support. So, with that being said, this brings us to a close. Um, before we go, though, I, we have a winter concert selection from our Hood School course. It's just going to take me a minute to rearrange this. Cut that off. And I'm going to hope that I get this close on the first try.
she came across that. I was like, So when you saw the agenda, it says st the study groups, right? So I didn't really talk much about that, but it's internally the structure that we have is, I think that a lot of faculty meetings can kind of be served by it's all by email, right? There's a lot of things that are shared at those meetings that aren't necessarily, um, they need to listen to talk. So I put them in study groups or, or like professional learning communities, they, they designate a topic. And that topic is how to generate team trust abilities between each other community. It eliminates teacher isolation, and there's so many benefits of that. So when they get together, they come up with these kind of things. So study, study groups to be able to make a space, uh, Steam Night, um, a group today that's working on uh, all sorts of different assessment techniques using like Google Classroom. One teacher was working on that. They were all sharing ideas like from each other, learning from each other. So that's kind of what those are designed for, and that's why that made the space that they the teach generally most of that stuff, which is really supported between their ideas. It's, it's, it's a nice way to look at teaching and learning and expert teachers to kind of, you know, everybody's got a little bag of tricks, right? And some teachers' bag of tricks, you can take that bag of tricks and you take things from it and share it across, and that's kind of our philosophy of that. So thank you. So it's so back to the desk thing, and this is again more for Mr. Bernard. Right. Is this a thing that is this something that the district would look at as a as an option for you know all schools budget permitting where we bring some of these standing desks in? Is this something that you think would be considered? I do. I think there's a place for it. I mean, we, I was just kind of offline here commenting to Mr. McKay that uh, Dr. McKay came I toured the school with him back a month or so ago. It just so happened that the classroom I went in had one of the desks, and there was a little bit of competition for it. So it was. Of course, I got a whole introduction to its use then from the student, yeah. you know, it was kind of neat to see, and it definitely, you know, there's something, something, there's something to be said about it. Yeah, the, 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 the oh, license, yeah. that's what yeah. happened, yeah, it could be, yeah, I mean, yeah. I think it was interesting, well it's interesting well to see. Yeah, yeah, too, yeah. I think yeah. for, for us, like, I, I think, when Mrs. Mercado was talking about it, too, it's hard to collect data on that, because as soon as you put the desk there, and then you ask the teachers and the kids to access it as they like it, it, it's yes, yeah. right? So, but there's no real measurable way to quantify it other than the yeah. kids' reports of how much they like it and it's always being accessed. And like I said, I just, I love seeing them self-access and being like, okay, like, I need a movement break. Like, I'm gonna go yeah, stand. That's what happened today, yeah. I was there, yeah. I was gonna say, sometimes it's more more than about, well, can you say, did a little bit better on this quiz or this report, or this writing assignment. It's more about, the student is more comfortable and able to better do the work in a better environment, right? And, and so, you know, obviously we can't afford it all by 2,600 standing desks uh, at this time, but it just seems like something, and obviously that needs to be more studied, but it seems like something that we should look at for the future. It's definitely, the more you read about it, the deeper you get, and that flexible seating, and there's other options too, and it's just, it's, it's very interesting. Yeah, yeah, rather, than by, rather than by 2600, it's by put some of those right. out and then also some other options. Yeah, right? like the, I always see the yoga ball so they can have a little bit of movement. Yeah. Or the chairs that are modified, but they put like a, a bicycle tube around them so they, they can just move their legs. Mm -hmm. There's just some interesting little things. And that's why it's great to have like an occupational therapist in each building because they share you know, that, with that, their expertise with the building. It's just great. I just want to compliment Mr. Larson's students. Because I don't know if he um, instructed them, but I think those students spoke louder than any students we've had. They didn't have any microphone, and you could hear every single one of them. Usually the kids are a little shy, and I, those kids were great. I mean, they were all great, but those kids really projected. That was nice to see. That, that's fun curriculum, too, that whole third grade Massachusetts social studies unit. So yeah. it's great to have those kids share that. And yes, they definitely work on that public speaking. Aspect. I was in there covering it for a collaboration block later on a Friday afternoon. This is collaboration block, and they were rehearsing 
um, some presentations that they were doing. I, was just, I monitored them as well. So yeah, there's definitely, you can see that he spends a lot of time on that kind of presentation and that standard. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate there's no quiz to make us feel dumb. <laughs> that, that usually happens at these stuff. Uh, Every once in a while I throw in a random message. <laughs> so, makes me feel good. I don't know. They know a lot more than me about it, so it's great to see. Um, I liked how he took that, that perhaps took like Howard Gardner musical intelligence, right? And, like there's those kids that won't remember those facts for forever, right? So they'll be driving through London store or wherever. And, like, Oh, yeah, they'll bring the little jingle will come back and they'll remember that mm. fact. And that's, that's pretty cool as well. So. Thank, well you. thank you all for hanging out, but I'm just going to go make sure all the kids come home safe. And, uh, You're lucky you have a short meeting. <laughs> I set up the conference room for you, so if you want a water, you can just let me know. Thank, thank, you. thank you. All right, next on the agenda, we're heading back to continued business. Um, and I will hand it over to.
So we, um, I think we're in, in line with what we thought the September uh, report was, as I had spoke of last month, we may have lost a little bit more than we expected, but I wasn't too surprised by that. That's kind of been the trend. And then we, we, we look to make up the, look those numbers. And I think the important thing is that with the mail count and the average daily participation is, is still showing signs of trending upwards, even despite um, several years now and several months where, where that's been the case. So the fact that that trend is still going in the right direction. In October, I was pleased to, that we, we earned a, a little bit of a higher net profit than, than we thought. Uh, typically, we look to have really good months in, in January and in May. Um, we might be slightly behind our, our projected amount after the first few months of the year, but there's plenty of time to make that up. So uh, there's, not, there's really no, no signs of significant concerns right now. With the, with the special education prepayment, is it only a portion of the prepayments that, that's been used? Or uh, it's only a portion. Okay. Uh, there is there is some some funds that are available, okay. um, but I think that, you know the majority of, of the amount that we exceeded the prepayment uh, we have encumbered based on the anticipated tuition cost, but um, there is some still some available funds there. And then the only other thing okay, I know it's a little so it seems like there's a lot that the ration bill that's are we doing okay with substitutes or are we over for that? Um, the substitute budget right now uh, we would look to be okay. Haven't had a um, need um, at this point in the year to extend uh, or a projected need that our long-term substitute budget would be, would be over, but that could change you know, quickly. We do monitor that. Um, the, the daily substitute, and the short-term substitutes that we receive on an ongoing basis, uh, we have been, it, like many districts across the state, um, struggling at, at certain days to some of the, the positions, um, but our, our fill rates have been between 60 and 70 percent. So we, we have been working at actively pursuing um, increasing our, our substitute pool, uh, but there has been days where it's been lower than we would have, we would have liked. But that, that's been a trend that's been pretty similar you know, across the state um, for right now, in most of the districts I've spoken to. Um, but I don't see any areas of concern in terms of us right now seeing our substitute budget. As a report, uh, in case. Michael, on the um, when I'm looking at the out of district tuition, it shows um, all but $9,510 to make. So I guess this is kind of following Scott's question. Okay. If we got another placement, do we have the funds to cover that? So there are funds unlimited right now in the general fund uh, to cover that. Uh, but we do have some funds available circuit breaker account. Okay. So where, where we do have um, a little bit of a contingency and a little bit of a, an available balance is in the special education reimbursement account. Um, we did receive a little bit more funds based on some final year adjustments in the, in the account that happened at the state level where we forecasted about conservative to 70% and we came in close to 75, we landed about 74%, which certainly helped. Uh, so we do have, you know, if something were to happen, we do have um, some funds available in that account to, to turn to. Um, we're certainly hope, you know, hopeful or hoping that won't be the case. If that would certainly help next year's budget in the situation if we don't have to kind of dip into that reserve right now in that account. Thanks. I think, I don't know if I heard Rich mumble this, but did you ask about what we're paying? Substitutes because I was going to ask him a week. Well, I, was gonna, I just was saying it makes sense that we have trouble given the job market. Right. Right. We, we did raise the amount, but I'm, are we having an issue because of what we're paying? Or is it? I, we, we raised the amount. Um, we, we, we upped it from $70 to $80. Okay. And I would say we're right in, in the average what the area districts are paying. Some pay slightly more than that, but most districts are paying between $75 and $80. Yeah. Um, so I don't think that's the big issue. I think it's just the market right now, and um, it's just the it's just tough to fill. And it's not it's not an operating issue right now. Okay. And, and I would just add that we've had some a couple of short term illnesses that uh, obviously were not anticipated. Normally, if we know when someone's going to be on a leave, they send a leave, we get notification. Of that. But we've had a couple of short term illnesses that have um, it resulted in us using people that we had as a day, you know, kind of a count on daily sub to do an extended assignment. 
And so that has taken a couple of people off the books that we would normally use for, you know, kind of like a, you know, might be like a three-week illness or uh, one case was a family member of a, of a teacher that was undergoing treatment for a serious illness, so that person needs to be out. So those were a little bit unanticipated. I don't want to over, overstate it, but they were just things that cropped up, unfortunately. Um, I think Richard's point is that teachers are either working full-time as teachers or they're working full-time somewhere else. Right. So yeah. I think yeah. that, that, is, that is true. The market's good right yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. I think, but as Michael said, I mean, our rates, we did go through that a couple of three years ago. Yeah. 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 We'll continue to look at it in this process. But it made us a little bit more competitive. The, the, the online system that we use that Michael took a lead on instituting, I think it's been helpful in us being able to draw subs in to be, they can, they can elect, they have their own account. The substitute teacher has their own account and they can select a job in whatever communities they want to work. That has helped us in some ways. Um, but at the same time, if there's a community that they're also on the list that pays five dollars more a day, they may go there. And that does happen to us. But. Yeah. I would say we the system allows a lot of the jobs to get filled proactively mm -hmm. uh, two or three days in advance for those planned absences. Right now, those last minute sick calls at 5.30 in the morning, that does take place. That's when we're having a little bit of a challenge to get those last minute you know, flow rates to, to increase. Uh, but we have been pushing um, you know, the postings and advertising. We actually reached out to the community not too, not too, too long ago to, to see if there were any one interested in, in something. And we got a pretty good response. We're starting to increase our, our pool. Uh, we get a lot of, of our sub go to substitutes get get full time jobs. Yeah. So a lot of those ones we relied on these last few years, you know, went on and, and got, got a full time position or got a long term position elsewhere in the district, even our district, even. Yeah. Um, so we are working on filling up that pool, but it, it's it's we're getting there. It, it's, this is a dumb question, probably, but it, what are the requirements to be a sub? Do you have to have a teaching degree? No. Mm -hmm. oh, I still don't have a week. freshman in college. They ran out of subs. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I did that too a little bit. Uh, yeah. A daily so, sub, we accept two years. Two years. Yeah. 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 And so in the next couple of weeks, we're going to probably have a few more subs. Yeah, yeah. 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 We got five potential right here. There we go. Well, I'll take a day off and one. Yeah. But for, for a longer term stand, yeah. we'll be looking for something that's licensed with a degree. Um, and Mr. Conley, would you like to uh, I would, yes. On? So the second part of the budget update, I wanted to bring an update to the committee. This was something that we certainly talked about during the, the budget goals, and we had talked about it being something that was going to be a topic this year um, of, of the budget and something we should look at. Um, and, you know, I did want to talk about the transportation contract and what our options are and some of the work <clears throat> and research that I have done to date really over the last six months and exploring what our options are and what the best avenue and what's the most advantageous decision for the district to undertake. So I did include about a two-page memo that summarized some of the steps and the options that we do have. Um, I included some data that I that I've collected over the last six months and some of the results of some surveys and some of my meetings with surrounding communities that have taken place over the last several months. Um, but we're getting to a point in December where we need to make a decision are we going to kind of test the market and go out to bid because in my opinion, transportation, we want to do that in, in, you know, in the not too distant future or do we want to exercise our option to extend the current agreement with North Reading Transportation um, for a fourth and then potentially a fifth year. So just as a refresher, um, we currently had a, a three-year contract with NRT Incorporation. Um, that contract with NRT expires on June 30th, 2018. We, so we have the option to extend um, for an additional two years. There are two one-year extensions um, to go up to as long as the fifth, fifth year. And as the memo discusses, after researching all of our options, I actually this evening am prepared to recommend that I do believe it is in our best interest right now to renew the existing agreement with NRT for a fourth and potentially a fifth year, though we don't need to do that uh, you know, today. We can wait and see what the situation is next year. Um, but in looking at the bus transportation market in, in Massachusetts right now and analyzing the results of 
those districts that have gone out to bid over the last 18 months, um, that is a market that continues to experience the increase. And I think it's due to a variety of factors based on the conversations I have had with area business managers, with transportation coordinators, and even with local providers um, in, this, in this market. Um, certainly healthcare continues to be a driver that's, that's driving um, bus rates up right now in Massachusetts. Um, the new Massachusetts sick time laws is certainly continuing to have an impact. And then right now there really is just an overall shortage of qualified bus drivers. The, the uh, registries have made some changes and just been, there are a lot of companies having difficulty getting qualified uh, drivers you know, pushed through the registration process and actually license to drive. And, um, Several of these factors are just continuing to result in an increase in the overall market. And that has been the case over the last 18 months. I mean, the, the bids that I have reviewed, um, districts in the market is certainly trending much higher than uh, our price that we're paying currently and the price that we would pay if we exercise in the fourth year um, of our contract. We went out to bid three years ago, we got five years of pricing, um, and that gave us the option to exercise that for the fifth year and then to evaluate the market and we're at that point where we need to, where we're doing that currently. You know, what, what's the status of the market? Is it, or is it should we test the market or was the pricing yielding such lower pricing three years ago? And I think it's the, the, the latter of the two. Um, you know, I really do believe it is in our best interest to exercise the, the renewal of um, the existing agreements. Um, if you look at the data and the rates for districts that have gone out to bid um, for FY19 this, this current year as well as next year, um, I've pulled all those districts that have recently done that. And in North Reading, um, agreement is about $25 lower than, than the average. Um, we, would, we would be due to pay $350 per bus per day in fiscal year 20, whereas um, the average of those districts that found the middle of the last 18 months has come in at 375, and many of those are districts that run three or four tier, um, you know, you know busing uh, systems like we do in North Bay. Um, so, you know, I've spoken to a lot of business managers. I've spoken to transportation coordinators. I've spoken to area providers that would act, that would that would be potentially bidding on on our bid, and they. They really feel we're looking at something in the 370, 375 range, or potentially higher right, right now. So um, the second part of the, the, the process that I, I did go through, and we talked about this in August when we developed our fiscal 2020 budget goals, was what are our options with the regionalized bid option? And um, Mr. Webster had seen an article um, that had spoke of some Metro West communities that had recently explored such an option and had attempted a regionalized bid about a year ago. It was dated December of 2017. So I reached out and spoken to those involved in these five communities that are listed in the memo that participated in such a venture a year ago. I also met with local business managers in the beginning of October this past fall. Um, you know, those included Reading, Winfield, Wilmington, Stoneham, Woburn, um, you know, Winchester, uh, Wakefield, they were all attended that meeting. And I, I, I talked about, and I shared the article, and I talked about such, such a, um, a possibility. I would say there was moderate level of interest by some of those communities in exploring it further. Um, that led to me collecting a series of data and, and sharing out a survey and a Google document, which I collected from each of them. So if, if there was enough interest, um, I would have the data I would need to actually develop such a big specification. Um, and there were a few communities out of those six or seven that at that point said they would, they would be interested in it. If it did go further, some had just gone out to bid and they were comfortable staying full and didn't feel like the, the contracts aligned up that made it advantageous for them. And some were just kind of comfortable kind of being, being you know, doing it. Um, and kind of individually on their own. Um, so it was kind of an interesting project, interesting data. Um, my conversations with the five communities, um, you know, Oxford, Auburn, Auburn, Webster, Dudley, Charlestown, um, were a few of them. They actually 
Uh, it did not end up working out for them. The article kind of spoke positively about the project. Um, they actually, only two of the communities, Leicester and Oxford, actually sent it a bid out. The other three ended up dropping out and staying on their own. And when they actually sent out the bid around this time a year ago, they only received one bid as they made they were they wanted to, the whole idea is that it would increase competitiveness, economies of scale, they would receive a lot more bid. And that bid that they did receive actually was a 30% increase over their current pricing. So they rejected that bid, and about a month later they went back out and tried it again. And the result was pretty similar, it was a 27% increase. And it, again, they only received one bid, and it was not a bid from any current provider that they currently had. Um, at this point, they decided to go their separate ways, and now it's March or April, it's late spring, it's getting late for them, they need to close, close up the process. And when they went out to bid on their own, one of those communities, New was Leicester, received the same pricing, and one of them received a 2.5% increase. So, um, you know, they felt, you know, they, they weren't sure if some of the companies got together and kind of pers persuaded, you know, you know persuaded, um, companies either not to bid or you know there's, there's a lot of speculation there but um, so I think I think at this point in time based on some of this research I think it certainly is a project that has merit I think it should be continued to be explored um, just with everything going in the market right now I don't think maybe this is the best time to do so um, especially we're getting to, to December um, but I think yeah, I'd like to kind of explore it down the road a year from now or two years from now um, have further, further more um, detailed conversations with these communities in the area, see if we can make better aligned contracts at that point in time, and, and try it again. I do think there's, there's merit in continuing to explore it. But I really don't believe that the market conditions are, are favorable for such a venture at this time, and I think it is in our best interest to exercise the, the optional here. Um, that'll open up any questions. I have a couple of thoughts or questions. Um, I mean, it makes sense, it certainly makes sense from the provider's point of view to keep everyone on individual contracts because it allows them to renegotiate a lot of their business on a regular basis and right. take advantage of rates of you know, the market going up. Um, did you end up speaking with any providers just conceptually about the idea or? I did, yeah, I did. So I, I did speak to two providers and um, you know, some of them had mixed, mixed feelings on it. You know, some of them felt, you know, unless you're going to start um, eliminating busing, uh, eliminating the number of buses by right. figuring out a way to put students on the same bus right. from different yeah. communities and consolidating, they didn't think it would have any significant impact yeah. in pricing. Um, that wasn't, that it's logistically very difficult to try to do that, but that wasn't the, the venture of the, the Western communities that participated. It was just kind of under the same contract, under the same pricing, but they were all being kind of doing the same separate groups. Um, so that was that was one thought. You know, some felt if it required a, a smaller company to then have to make a significant capital investment in, in equipment to meet the, the demand, it could price them a little bit out of the market and then you're only going to get on some of these large, a much larger company and you know that could impact service. Now you have a very large company and uh, that could you know, be one company that has the ability to uh, meet such a re requirement and a scale, a scope and size of a, that contract. So they, you know, they felt it might um, be a challenge there as well. Um, so it, it was certainly interesting you know, conversations. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and I would just say, my only other comment is, um, I mean, I think it's worthwhile to sort of keep that finger in the wind to see, to see what's possible in the future, but also to keep it in mind as we go through the process of discussing the very beginning process is going to be school start times. Yeah. Because it, you know, obviously that's going to throw a, a bit of a monkey wrench into yeah. transportation anyway if, if we end up proceeding in that direction. So um, that might be a time in the future to sort yeah, of re revisit that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, but I was, I mean, certainly the districts were, that I spoke, called and spoke to uh, were very, um, Helpful, and they almost they were very excited to almost call me back and have a conversation about the experience. Because yeah. um, everyone wants to see if they can floor their right, right. transportation costs, no question. Right. <laughs> Do you have a sense? I'm sorry, one more question. Do you have a sense of uh, the numbers on your on your uh, spreadsheet here? 
how, how many of them were recently bid, and some, how many of them were sort of legacy contracts? Like yeah, we are, I would say about um, I would say about half of these were recently bid within the last year. Some of the some providers actually sent me uh, bid results that they had over the last you know, 12 months, and you know, some responded to my survey. Um, so a good amount of these were, think were, were items that were recently bid. I can tell you, everyone that had bid over the last 12 months to 18 months did experience a significant increase. Um, you know, some going from price ranges that we have now, um, 340, 350, 360, to over 400. Michael, one, first, I think it makes the most sense to just take the fiscal year 20 rate from uh, NRT. That seems like the best deal. Um, the question I have is, an explanation for, like, you see a couple of anomalies on here. Lexington, almost $500 a bus. Yeah. And a new report is just going to be a little bit 300 Is that, a, do those districts, because you don't have a provider, are they doing their own busing, or? No, I mean, I know Lexington has, I, mean, I believe they actually have AA and transportation. Oh, okay. um, and yeah, I was a little surprised at some of these numbers and, and why they were so high. I don't know if it's just, you know, with, geographically where they're located. The Maybe it's longer routes, routes and they have the buses longer. Yeah, 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 I guess. Yeah. Has one, yeah. They must have a lot to do. Yes, it does. Yeah. And this market, it's huge. That's huge. So. And sometimes they'd be less willing to, to um, yeah, be the most efficient. Yeah. Yes. Right. And then the other thing is there are so few companies. Even even if, if yeah. there aren't that many companies offering these services. Michael Connolly. I know. Michael Connolly. I was going to say. Yes. Yes. Michael, how, how good is that? How much money are you making That's on that deal? Know, it I is know. a different spelling. I, was like, I, yeah, I saw that and I was like, wow. I, know. I, I went into question. You get me. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, is this my phone? Yeah. On the side of running this Yeah, I thought it was good with the information and research. And we started, we started, certainly started the conversation with many of these area communities. Um, so I think they'd be interested in picking it up again in the future. Yeah, my, my only concern is, of course, the longer we delay, the more it's going to be. And I, I, don't, I don't know if we can cap on another couple of years, but it's, I, I just worry that things like this are never going to get less expensive. I don't think we're ever going to be back here in a year and a half. Oh well, actually, the rates come down from busing. Yeah, I mean the market the market can change. You know, I, I've I've been you know, sending out transportation bids um, for quite some time, and I you know I've seen it I've seen it change, and I've seen um, you know going out to bid at the right time, and it does yield the savings. I think you know once potentially in the future these these providers get kind of over the hump of dealing with the health insurance market and the ACA and the minimum wage challenges and migrating a, a change in the Sick Leave Law or Act. And, um, it, it, there's a, just a significant critical shortage of drivers right now, and I think that can change too. So I think it's, you know, it, it could, it's potentially go down, but certainly right now, I think it's most likely that would go up. I think the other thing to think about is, I, I have no idea how this would affect pricing, but if bus companies become less dependent on gasoline-driven vehicles yep. and move to electric, Yep. At some point, those could become less expensive to operate. Now, sure. there's going to be a cost to obviously invest in those electric vehicles, but yep. and that's probably five, eight years down the road. I just think of getting a price of three fifty. That's the rate we're looking at, right? Correct. Yeah. I think if you look at the rest of the rates, if we go up to bid, we're not going to get anything as close to three fifty. No, that's correct. Right. So, I think there's no question to take the rate. Just, yeah. I'm just wondering about it. I mean, and if you do it one year at a time, so. Well, I guess, I think what Mr. Buckley is suggesting, correct me if I'm wrong, take the rates and also negotiate the next two years now. Yeah, well, the issue with that is we, we have to go out to bid. So right now, we have the option to go as long as five years for transportation. Sure. Um, so, you know, it has to be a sealed bid process. Right. And you can't, and they can't bid for two years from now. Right, right. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there was a motion. Motion talks about the fourth and fifth year, but I think it's fine to amend that. Just, just say the fourth year. Yeah. 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 Yeah
process. Yeah. They do have a new rep, I know that, who came in recently and introduced themselves to me. So, uh, yeah, we're the same, their same uh, Bay representative for the last number of years, so there would be some, um, someone new. Refresh my memory. If Mr. Buckley takes the uh, opportunity to do the contract, if he can't make it, could I step in? For I mean, yes, yeah, I think okay. so, yes. Then you would like to do it that way? Yeah, All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, subcommittee updates.
I know I, I'm happy to. I'm just I'm laughing because I'm rapidly becoming an expert. Right? So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, the old song. So, right. so I think, um, and I think I sent an update out yeah. right, maybe Thursday, Wednesday, or Thursday. I forget. Right, shortly after the meeting. Can I wait no, on that? So, because what happened was. Um, you know, I left that meeting, I think we were all of the opinion that we, it was kind of, it looked like it was over for this season. We didn't think we were going to, you know, be able to get slot in there because of weather, or anticipated weather. So ultimately what happened was, um, when I learned that the existing slot had been cut, which led, I think, a reasonable person to conclude, we know that that's not going to be good for the spring. We know that's, gonna, that's not going to be so. Yeah. I kind of took the bull by the horns a little bit and, and got on the phone with the gentleman that is doing the project. And again, we're a little bit at their mercy because they are doing it for a very reduced cost. And it's a nice gesture that they're doing, you know, kind of in the spirit of community service. And um, to their credit, they were there the next day. And they, the facade was laid on Saturday, actually, I don't know if you deny, but they worked pretty diligently on. So I think we met on Tuesday, I called on Wednesday. They were there Thursday, Friday, Saturday. You know, we kind of looked at what the weather was going to be like for a period of time. Now, it may or may not work. If it doesn't work, then we're no worse off than we were. We right. saw it being cut. Right. So I felt like it was worth at least trying this. And they're committed to, if it's not, you know, we'll deal with it in the spring if we have to, but we have options. We do have kind of a, in a good way, a bit of a funky schedule for baseball in the early part of the season. We're moving games off site that our, our schedule to be home games is not all that problematic. If we have to flip a couple of games, we've done things like this before for, for other projects we've undertaken. So I think I saw that there was more positives to uh, working with the, with, the, with the contractor to get them in and try to do what they were able to so that's what we did. Um, so I'm hoping for you know, a mile a week or two here, which it looks like right now it is. Um, and hopefully over the winter that, that song will, will take root and you know, we'll be okay in the spring. But it's, it's a little bit risky, but. What we had was not going to work. We knew that. So we still pounced there. Always put the saw down at the end of the project. And you know, mm -hmm. I've been told by many, many a sod expert <laughs> that they can put it down in risky cold temperatures. Yeah. Okay the gentleman doing down. the work was. I don't think he would have done it. Yeah, exactly. It's, kind of, yeah. it's, it's, his, it's on his dime. Right. He's going to have to go back and do it again. So when we did the when we did the multi-purpose building the softball down, that was first week of November. Yeah. I think, right? Yeah. We went back and looked. It was early November. Yeah. Now, this is, you know, four weeks later, roughly. But, you know, it's been mild. It's been wet. You know, I think all those things can be positive. Yeah. So we'll see. Very good. Very good. Very good. He was very good. No, he understood, I think, the pressures. And, you know, he's trying to balance this job with jobs that are paying him a lot more, you know, money. And, you know, I, I respect that. I get it. You know, so you have to take what you can get. He's a very good guy and does nice work. So. Can, can I ask about, about the concession stand one more thing? Now, you might know this, but if the music boosters are the ones that brought all the games to get the money, yeah. if they don't have to do the work afterwards, is there any thought that other groups are going to want to now do that as well? Because other groups don't have to. Okay. Do, like, we don't have to. Because nobody else is right Basketball yeah. boosters have a have a concession stand, and it's not supposed to be food in the gym, but believe me, I've been to the games, there's tons of food in the gym. They don't have to clean so the no sodium. Yeah. They're the only group. I just don't know if there's any, if there's going to be other groups that are now interested in selling things and making the money from the concessions instead of. I don't think. Probably not including just raising them. So. <laughs> No one knows why it ever right. ended up. Right. It's, it's, it's been done before John came. I've been here 16 years. And it's yeah. been that way. I don't know. I, I never liked it either. But it was they all. It kind of seemed okay. Right. Right? They were getting the benefit program was benefiting from it. But I think I think we can do better. Yeah. And other than that, was just the, the tennis sports. Oh yeah, we did talk. That's right. That was the issue. That was, no, that was the issue brought up by Rita, which I had on my list too, was to put some sort of. Um, maybe small grandstands at the tennis court. And Mr. Bernard is already looking at possibly putting some concrete pads in and yeah. benches, possibly So I, I have an update on that. I, I did meet with the gentleman last Thursday morning. Mr. Palazzolo is a North Bend guy. He's done some work with us in the past. Very good guy. He met with me um, Thursday morning. He sent me the quote today for two 12-foot by 30-foot concrete pads, basically centered on, if you can picture the tennis courts, if you're in the parking lot side, these would be 
splitting the, the net. So on each side of the net. Right. right. So, so you'd be watching the two courts. Yeah, you'd see the three courts, right. and it would be centered on the net line. Yeah. And he sent me the quote, um, and it was a pretty involved job. I mean, he's doing it, you know, digging down 12 inches, putting eight inches of crust stone, four inches of concrete, all mesh, wire mesh. It was $9,600 for the two pads, 12 feet by 30 feet long. And they could be used, you know, whether we do the, we talked about kind of the memorial bench right. slack or, or a small set of aluminum bleachers, much like we did this up and that kind of thing. So the, um, the Hall of Fame, right. Chuck Carinci at the meeting had said, um, you know, if you want to get the quote, I sent it to him today on her phone, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's right, Chuck. He's texting me about, texting me about other things, but he has to send the quote yeah. and we'll see what we can do. So I did, I did share that with him. And so that, you know, it, it seemed reasonable for the amount of, he's going to bring in a you know, heavy equipment to yeah. pay down, and, you know, so I, we'll see. But I think, I think it would be a nice finished product to the. I think it's a legitimate request. Course. I've been approached by a couple of parents to have a couple, at least one small set of not two of grandstands. Oh, I think it's very reasonable. And very um, reasonable. Also, um, Marty Tilton from Parks and Rec said he was going to get some quotes on some small grandstands. I was going to bring up one other thing. You know, I, I, think, I think this is good for kind of the public and the rest of the community to you know, too, is that there's talk of putting some electronic heating systems oh, in the right. concession stand, the lavatories in the building right. for, yeah. you know, kind of the November you know, right. use. So it looked um, like that was going to be a town project. Yeah. So, um, and I have those corner electric type heater blowers. Our New England ancestors are rolling in your graves. <laughs> <laughs> but it has been particularly cold the last few weeks. Yes. Uh, well, this past Thanksgiving Day game, we're going to enjoy it. And one day, what did one I mean, Linfield, they brought in portable heaters, right? For the field. Oh, for the, field. Field. Oh, the, field. Oh, field. Over the uh, bathrooms. They did, so, yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, they did have electric heaters in there. Yeah. Um, beyond that, I think that's what my notes show is. I'm just going to be covering that. Meeting. There was no other subcommittee meeting, so um, the upcoming schedule, the policy subcommittee will meet December 6th at 3.30 in the superintendent's room. The finance planning team meets December 13th at 8.15 a.m. in the superintendent's conference room. Yeah, or I believe we're coming in at 7.45, right? Um, the CIPC will meet December um, 13th at 4 p.m. at Town Hall in Room 5. The Substance Abuse Coalition meets December 18th at 10 a.m. in the North Reading Police Station. North Cam Board of Directors meets December 27th at 7 p.m. in the North Cam Office. And the Athletic Subcommittee meets again on January 8th, 2019 at 12.30 p.m. in the Superintendent's Room. Um, Mr. Bernard? And Jim, I do. I think uh, you all have a copy. I, I have a few things to share with you tonight. Um, one is just for your information, a printed copy of my fall newsletter that went out um, just before Thanksgiving. Um, so just a copy for your, your information. You're not going to read it for us? I'm sorry? You're not going to read it for us? A dramatic reading? I don't know. 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 I've included it for you kind of my traditional presentation. Um, it listed the information and data on the um, most recent uh, SAT score report. Um, I gave this to you in a little bit different format this year because this is the first year. We, this is kind of baseline data for us now for the first full year of the new exam, um, whereas in the past it had been one, one session of the old exam and one session of the new. And these scores, you should know too, they represent students' latest score only. They do not represent their best score, which is a little bit of an interesting statistic. It's their latest score. So if a student took a, a, a fall SAT and a spring SAT again, it would be the spring SAT only regardless of their enrollment. So and there's no comparison to last year? Not with apples to apples. That's it, yeah. Is it? No. Okay. No. So I think, you know, we're very, very well. This we're in, we, I also would probably attention to our number of test takers was very high. Some of you will remember that last year's senior class was only four five just to come through in about probably about 20 years. I wanted to share. What the colleges look at? Does it depend on the colleges? Do they look at labs? It does. It does. More and more schools were finding to using the ACT. Yeah. yeah. The um, SAT2 subject tests are becoming more and more popular. And 
and more and more schools are making SATs and ACTs lower down the list Correct. of priorities in terms of when you apply. Right. Like they, I mean, they might be, whereas they might have been one or two before, now they're like three or four. Right. They're looking at, they are really looking at well-rounded students, grades obviously, but you know, what do they participate in, et cetera, et cetera. Are you going to comment on the fact that we again outperformed the Linfields? I really do like the fact that okay. we again outperformed I, I was counting on you to raise because, that. Because yeah. I'm hoping the Linfields should pretend and call you again to wonder how do you keep. You remember that? Yeah, of course I remember that. that. Thank you. Thank how you. would I forget that? It's we'll Linfield. talk about that at the dinner she has to buy me for winning the football game, but for not winning the football game. I bet I'm not invited. I bet I'm not invited to that. Three years in a row. No, it's ready. Good thing there's not a multiplier on that. Exactly. Um, Sherry, I, I've updated you before on the work of the social emotional learning retreat. Um, the work of the, of the 29 people that, um, that participated in this year's retreat came to, to a close in November. And so I just I shared a kind of a, not a closing letter, but a, an update, I think, if you will, of the work as it came to a close for the three formal sessions. And I just I, I thought it would be where the, where the SEL work is one of my um, goals in my educator plan. I want to kind of try to keep you informed of, of what's going on in relation to relation to SEL. I've attached for you tomorrow night, um, there is a, um, what I think is going to be a very interesting presentation. If you don't, if you don't know Meredith Casey, she's one of our students at the middle school. She has started the Meri uh, Mighty Meredith Project, and she is a terrific young lady who is doing some really wonderful work around um, raising awareness around head injuries and, 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 the, and the impact of concussions. And she, her foundation, and she's had a pretty, pretty sizable uh, nonprofit going in the Mighty Meredith Project. Her foundation is bringing a gentleman in tomorrow night at the Performing Arts Center at the Middle High School. Um, this, um, Dr. Christopher Nowinski will give you a copy of the, the flyer. But um, my last conversation with Meredith's mother last week was that there were about 165 or so people registered to attend tomorrow night. And I, I would expect, I think I did a, another all call email on. Friday, there was a nice article in the transcript on Thursday, and there was actually a piece I saw in the Globe yesterday, the Sunday Globe, kind of in a, it's not called the Globe North anymore, it's like Globe Local or something, okay. but again, it was a little blurb in there that I saw as well, so she sent an extra, about this program. And this is, this is the one, the, the co-founder of the BU CTE Center, that's correct. the, this that's guy the big one, the, 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 the formal, yeah, the formal yeah, wrestler, yeah. 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 He's like a big, he's a big deal. Yeah. He's a yeah. wrestler, he played football. For all the NFL players. Yeah, like their this, this guy is so probably this the is, smartest guy on this. This is the real deal, I and mean, this is going to be a pretty significant presentation. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. so if you can make it, you know, and plus, I'm not sure, are we live tonight, Jason? No. No, okay. Um, so, that's, I think, going to be interesting tomorrow night. And then lastly, some of you have said already, but um, I just wanted to give a, a shout out to um, the cast and crew and to, to, to Allison Kane and her, um, her uh, faculty staff for um, this past weekend's performance of the Shrek. The musical is fantastic. Um, Sell out crowds. They're sold out again for, um, for um, this coming Friday and Saturday. Um, just once again, I think the expectations have been exceeded as far as what um, our performing arts programs are. And then the good news department, we have two of our students, some of you, um, I think all of you know Michael Tyrell because he's one of our student reps of the school committee, but also um, um, Samantha Martel have been named uh, commended students in this year's um, PSAT, NMSQT, National Arts Scholarship Qualifying Test, which is, represents about 34,000 students across the country that get recognized for their outstanding performance on, on the PSAT. So it's, we traditionally have Students recognized, on occasion we'll have a student named as a semi-finalist, but um, it's just, you know, two very, very bright students that are you know, continuing to do well, and I think it's nice to, to acknowledge them publicly and all of you. Yeah, one thing I wanted to add about the um, performance that I went Friday night, there was a large number of students there, which I really like to see students supporting their fellow students, and there was a big number. I saw Michael Tyrell, he was in very kind, but that was a large number of students, and that's always good to see. And you think about it, it's sold, it's over 2,600 tickets, because the odds are hold what, 664? Six, six, Not that I would know that number. Yeah. Jerry still so so Jerry Jerry believes that seats in there, but <laughs> so that, that's pretty impressive. I, thought, I mean, I, I also love that, like when I went on Saturday for the matinee, there were 
ton of little kids there. Yeah. Yeah. And was, but what was great was just like the little kids seeing the high school, and you heard a lot of the parents saying, oh, the middle school's attached to this, and yeah. just seeing it, and you know, and I, and I also like that there were younger kids, students in the right. performance as well, which is great. I mean, Julie Kopke's daughter was in it, you mm -hmm. know, as a fourth grader, and so I just think it's great that, you know, that the kids have an introduction to it, and we even went to the Shrek, uh, the Shrek Fest the oh, next day. Oh, Shrek Fest on Sunday? We did that the next day, which was great, and the students brought them around, and it was, it was good, it was fun. It's, just, it's a good performance, it gets a, uh, I think, for, especially for my son who's in fourth grade, I think it's great for him to get comfortable in the school, and just gives an opportunity That's his subtle way of saying, John, keep the agenda. That's true. exactly what I was just saying. So, Mr. John, keep the agenda short for next week. So, you say that a lot lately. Okay. 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 Okay.